so um, welcome to uh, a Stronger Together Meet the Scholar uh, conversation. Uh, those of you who don't know me, uh, 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 I, I'm a seam caller at the University of Minnesota, uh, and I'm a member of the STR Executive Committee. Uh, and I'm assisted today by uh, Vivian Gua, who's uh, going to be handling all the logistics. So she's the person who has the real power because she can press a button and throw you out of this call. Uh, but of course, our star today uh, is uh, Professor Gautam Mahuja, uh, who is our distinguished scholar. Uh, so Gautam uh, is uh, the Eleanor and George Landu Professor of Management uh, at Cornell. Uh, prior to we held faculty positions at UT Austin and the University of Michigan, uh, University of Michigan being also where he got his PhD back in 1996 uh, with a dissertation that looked at uh, alliance networks and, and patenting in the chemical industry. A dissertation I would add that won, I think, every award imaginable and a few that I suspect they made up just so they could give him an award. Like there's at least a couple of these awards I've never heard of, but you know. Um, and then he's, of course, continued to win many, many, many awards. So many, in fact, that you know, if I was to put them all on this slide, it would turn this, uh, this session into an eye exam. But just to mention a few, uh, he was the uh, Tim Division's Distinguished Scholar in 2019. He's won the Dan and Mary Lou Shandell Best Paper Prize from SMJ. He's won our very own BPS Urban Educator Award. He's been honored uh, multiple times by the SMS. Uh, he, you know, shamefully only managed to achieve the number two position in Business Week's most popular professors in America. Uh, and he was also honored uh, by being asked to give a keynote at the Pravasi Bharatiya Divas, making him basically the non-resident Indian of the year. Uh, Gautam is also a, a, clearly a glutton for punishment because he is the editor-in-chief of Organization Science and has been since 2017 before which he was associate editor for an incredible 14 years uh, at organization science and then six years uh, at, uh, before that at management science. Uh, he's also been a division chair for the Tim division and executive committee member for, uh, for BPS uh, and for about a decade, uh, department chair for strategy at Michigan. Um, he's uh, mentored about literally dozens of doctoral students, either as an advisor or as a committee member, uh, several of whom I know uh, are, are signed up uh, and, and, and are, will be joining us. Uh, and in all, while he's been doing all that, he's also managed to amass a, just a phenomenal body of research, uh, making really seminal contributions to our thinking about technological capabilities, innovation, search, uh, alliance networks, acquisitions, and more recently, institutional strategies. The thing I'm, you know, particularly blew my mind, uh, Gautam, thinking of this was, you know, I think most of us would kill to have one paper that gets 2,000 plus citations. You have six of them, and five of them were published in a three-year period. So I just, I don't know how you did that, but we'll come back and talk about that in a second. Before that, welcome. Thank you so much uh, for agreeing to do this. Uh, uh, and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen uh, so we can all see kind of the uh, group of people who are here. Um, just to, uh, before we start, just a couple of quick guidelines. If everyone can keep their, uh, can stay on mute uh, unless you're talking, that will be great. Uh, we're gonna do about an hour uh, of an interview with Gotham and then we'll open up the Q&A. But in the meantime, feel free to add questions that you wanna ask as they occur to you in the chat. Uh, and we can come back and look at them then. Uh, 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 and so that's kind of the ground rules. Um, so, Gautam, um, let's, let's start at the beginning, right? So you got your uh, undergraduate in economics from what is arguably the most prestigious institution in India. You got your MBA from what is definitely the most exclusive MBA school in India, even if I say so myself. Uh, you know, corporate India is your oyster. Why do you, what, what prompted the decision to move to academia? Yeah, that's, um, first of all, uh, thank you very much for uh, having me. I'm, I'm truly honored to be here and to be a part of, uh, uh, you know, uh, this community. And I also wanted to 
thank you and Samina and the organizers for doing a tremendous job and a tremendous service uh, because uh, we are a profession that is uh, different from others. And at this point in time, of course, we are all uh, very segregated, but the strength of our profession has always been the ability to communicate with each other. And in that sense, solidarity itself is a way to lessen anxiety for, for everybody. So I am uh, not just honored, but grateful to be given this opportunity to even uh, you know, communicate with uh, those of you that are here. And, and hopefully this uh, is an attempt to bring in some uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, some connectivity in a time that is otherwise, uh, you know, very, very um, uh, socially isolating. Yeah. The, uh, uh, to, uh, and thank you also for the very kind introduction. Uh, the, uh, uh, I mean, I, we, we may can come back to it, but you might be surprised that, uh, what I did to, to achieve it versus what, what happened, but never mind that. We'll come back to that. Uh, the, uh, see, here, the interesting thing is I am truly what I would call an accidental scholar. Uh, after I graduated from my MBA program, I got a job with uh, Ponds, which was a part of the Unilever group. At that point in time, it was the job to get from uh, uh, the Institute. And uh, if somebody had told me that, you know, in this company, in three years from now, you will head a quarter of the country's operations, uh, I would have said, okay, which arm do I have to cut or do I have to give you both an arm and a leg? And, and I would have given it to you. Uh, but the interesting thing is that uh, once I joined the company, uh, somehow, uh, I mean, that was the company culture uh, of very quick movement and so on. And uh, less than four years, I think three and a half years, uh, from joining as a management trainee, I was serving as the regional head for Northern India, which was a quarter of the country, uh, you know, uh, this thing for uh, the entire sales function. But it was more of a general management role as well, because you basically uh, manage the entire operations and, uh, you know, including the administrative part, not just uh, the, the sales and marketing part. Yeah. But, uh, uh, and, uh, and that kind of got me thinking. So here I've, you know, joined, I've Basically, every year I got promoted and I'm in this dream position. Uh, what could have gone better for me than it has gone right now? And the answer was I couldn't think of anything. And then I asked myself, uh, is there something, some part of you that is still not happy? And the answer was yes. And then I said, uh, well, clearly, if things can't get better on this trajectory, then repeating the same thing in the hope that it will get better is, uh, you know, well, you know, is, is insanity as has been argued before. And so I decided to, uh, to change my uh, sort of, to think about what I wanted to really do in life. And uh, as luck would have it, I, you know, I was running a, a little, I'd done some, I've forgotten what the details are, but some, uh, you know, corporate thing which uh, had worked. And so my boss said, why don't you sort of brief the other managers on it? Because I think it's a good idea, you should diffuse it and so on. And uh, so we had a little mini conference kind of thing and I you know, workshop or whatever you want to call it. And I, uh, you know, spent the morning uh, articulating and laying out the ideas and so on. And when we were walking out, uh, my boss told me, um, you missed your calling. You should have been a, been a professor. And uh, what he didn't realize was that these words were falling on very, very fertile ground. And at that point in time, I was already thinking very seriously about quitting uh, uh, Unilever and uh, becoming a high school teacher. And uh, when I eventually approached him uh, uh, six or months or a year later, and six months maybe later after that, I said, uh, you know, I want to talk to you about this. And he said, uh, and he first tried to dissuade me saying, no, no, you should stay and so on. But then he was a, a very thoughtful guy. He said, look, if you are going to do this, then get a PhD and uh, become a business professor because there's a lot you've learned and you can share about that will never get used and the research part will be helpful to you. And, and, and that turned out to be some of the best advice I've received in my life. And that's what I ended up doing is that I, uh, I decided to, uh, to apply for a PhD and, uh, and quit and then, you know, life started a new year. Uh, you know, I, I feel like I should get the address of this person and send him a bouquet of flowers saying thank you. But, uh, <laughs> um, so, so you, you move to Ann Arbor, you start your PhD. Is it everything you expected? Were there things that surprised you? Were you 
Okay. It was actually almost nothing that I expected. I had no idea what I was getting into. Um, I only knew of uh, two papers, both were in HBR, uh, and uh, they were written by the same person who was in, in Michigan at the time. And uh, I thought that was what the research part entailed. And uh, I thought this was going to be a, a wonderful, uh, uh, the, uh, it would be a wonderful, uh, you know, uh, sort of way to, uh, uh, to sort of build out whatever is missing in my life. So I show up there and then I realize within the first two days, I'm disabused of the notion of what is research. And that also disabused of the notion that teaching has anything significant to do with the job. <laughs> and uh, at that point in time, uh, I was like, okay, so I didn't know what I was in for, but you know, we'll see where this goes. And uh, the, uh, uh, you know, and I, I basically enrolled there. I was uh, also at that point in time, somewhat like what is going on today, the economy was in bad shape, the market was very poor, and what happened was, uh, uh, so it was basically the idea that, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, most of the people were not getting jobs. Like the previous two years of, of PhD students were in visiting positions and so on. So uh, as a safeguard, I decided that I always was interested in economics. I'd done undergrad, you know, in economics. So I decided to do the coursework for the econ PhD as well, thinking that if at some point of time, that gives me two more years to decide whether I want to stay in business or go, go to the econ side. So I just did the coursework for the econ PhD, uh, along with the coursework for the strategy and, and IB stuff. So, uh, and, uh, and then somewhere along the line, I, uh, you know, it, uh, it very likely, I, I, mean, I, I did think of, of quitting originally, uh, and I'd love to say that it was love of academia that kept me here, but it was simply the embarrassment of going back without having tried fully. So I said, you know what, I'll see what it is because I don't want to go back. And very honestly, if I had to look back and say the thing that kept me was, well, I can't go back because I, I you know, it's not like I burnt my bridges. I think the company would have taken me back in a trice, but uh, uh, it just felt that that wasn't adequate. Let me take a chance. And, and that's where I, I sort of got into it. And uh, I think an important lesson that I learned from it was that even though I had no clear understanding of the research component of the job, once I got engaged in it, I really loved it. And I got engaged in it because I had no choice, right? I had to, if I had to survive in the program, I had to get active about research. And I said, well, I might as well do this and, and so on. And the important lesson I learned is very often people tell you, follow your passion, and that's wonderful. Except you need to know what your passion is. And I didn't have that, you know, the, what I thought was my passion was disabused off in the first day, right? right. And, uh, and then I discovered that there is a, another way of thinking about this problem, which is whatever you choose to do, if you commit to do it and commit to doing it well, you develop a passion for it. So for me, excellence did not come, or at least success did not come from passion. It is passion that came from succeeding at trying to do something very hard. So effort led to passion and not the other way around it. And I think that's very important as a, as a lesson for me. And, and that is uh, worked for me through most of my life. So I don't prejudge things. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think that's a lesson that many PhD students could potentially benefit from. So, um, but, so thinking back to those, to continuing to think about those years, you know, I was looking at your CV and I was noticing that the first paper you ever published was actually on, is it profitable to be green looking at, you know, environmental strategies? And I mean, forgive me, but I don't really think of you as a CSR sustainability person. So, so tell us a little bit, a bit about that. How did that happen? You know, was that a, is it a dream deferred? Was it a step that you decided this is not where I want to go? Yeah. See, again, and this is actually very connected to the previous question. It actually, uh, you know, like everybody coming into a PhD program, you come in with a certain degree of idealism, right? Um, so uh, this was a project that one of the faculty members there was very passionate about, and I got involved with it because it seemed like it would be very interesting and it was a very, it, it's appealed to me in a very visceral fashion, okay? 
Uh, and so I started working on it, but very quickly I learned that it was definitely not fashionable and it was definitely not sort of in demand. And being very pragmatic at that point in time, I said, okay, what is in demand? And sort of move there. And there is a story that hangs there also because I, uh, uh, I actually had a very, very difficult time in my PhD. I did the coursework just fine. I mean, even though it was kind of twice the load of, uh, you know, that I was expected to do, but that was something that, you know, my prior background is a kind of IMA kind of prepares you for doing large amounts of, uh, you know, algorithmic work. So as you know, well, uh, and, uh, and that wasn't the problem. The problem was that uh, uh, I could not come up with a dissertation topic. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, I spent about, you know, my first two years, you know, sort of working on a couple of papers of this, that, and the other, and uh, no luck on the dissertation, really. I mean, I wrote those required papers for, you know, things, and, and they were, the lit review was always excellent, and then it just went downhill very fast, okay? Um, uh, my first year after the comps and everything, it just got worse. Uh, I was just running around in circles and another six months passed by now three and a half years had passed and uh, I still had no, no dissertation topic. And at that point in time, uh, uh, you know, I, I actually physically fell sick because of the stress. Uh, and uh, somewhere along uh, the way, I, I started wondering whether I could ever make it through this program. At that point in time, uh, a couple of things happened, and this is where chance sort of plays its, its you know, role. Uh, we had a, a doctoral student, you probably know him well, is an eminent scholar now, Kulwant Singh, uh, the National University of Singapore. He was in the PhD program a couple of years ahead of me. Mm -hmm. And he was always a kind of a mentor to me and, you know, a good friend. And he saw me suffering and, and literally suffering now, you know, by the time I'm in the medical definition of suffering at this point in time. And, uh, so he kind of took me aside and he said, look, why don't you work on this alliance thing? Okay. And, uh, you know, alliance and networks is the new hot area. You know, I would have, if they told me to pick blue cheese, I'd have picked it. It's not like I had some passionate burning desire to study alliances or uh, networks. And so I, I started reading that literature and so on. And shortly after that was the academy meetings. And I went to the meetings and uh, I, I was walking through the, you know, hotel door and uh, I ran into um, uh, Ranjay Gulati and Nitin Norya, who were working very ac actively on, on uh, networks. And I knew um, Ranjay from my college days. We, were, we overlapped in college. He was a senior of mine. And, uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, they were very kind. And Nitin said, why don't you come, you know, and I was telling, they asked me what I was working on. I said, well, <laughs> good question. <laughs> And so I didn't even try to put on a pretense of, you know, I've got some great ideas going on in this thing. I just said, yep, like, this is where I am. And Nitin said, oh, you know what, let's go to my room, let's talk. And, uh, and we went to, uh, Nitin and Ranjay sat down and, and then they kind of charted out and said, look, why don't you look at the performance implications of alliances? I mean, these things are all these things, we all are making these huge claims, but nobody's actually looking at that. So here's your research question. And so those two chance meetings uh, led me to a uh, dissertation and then a research career. So uh, the outcomes would have been very different, but for uh, these two accidental meetings and the generosity of the people involved who actually bothered to, you know, say, okay, what can we do to help you? And, uh, and that was just wonderful. Yeah. And I mean, you know, clearly, as I said, it, you know, it turned into a, a really incredible dissertation, right? I mean, you, you won multiple awards, you published, I think, both of the papers from that in 2000, one in ASQ, one in SMJ, which I think both have like amassed, I don't know, how many thousands of citations. What do you think, I mean, looking back, what do you think, I mean, of course, the sort of question is important. What else do you think contributed to the success of those papers? See, I think there were three things that I would, uh, I, I'll put them in, in sequential order, though if you want to look at them in terms of impact, I think the order would be reversed, okay? Because I, I just go with how it happened. And, and that also should highlight how 
random this process can be in terms of you know you know the dif this difference between 6000 citations or whatever it is that the asq paper has and whatever 2000 odd that the other one has uh, and uh, essentially not even getting published so that's there is that randomness there but the key thing is so i think beginning with what i did what i did was having suffered through those three and a half years this was one lifeline that i was given by these three people okay it, like any man who is drowning at sea if you give him a lifeline there is nothing else in the world he's going to hang on to okay and i said this is my one shot my one chance i'm going to give it everything i have and so i went completely berserk uh, on reading every possible because that was always my solution to everything in life was to read uh, and I read literally hundreds of articles in sociology, in economics. I'd never done sociology at all. Uh, and uh, um, randomly, you know, somebody told me you're becoming too much of an economist. So I, I randomly went and sat in on, on Mark Mizrohi's class. And then I was hooked. And that's where the network spot, you know, came in. And I just read a lot. And the other part is that the econ PhD part, which I never used in the sense of you know, going on to the, you know, to write an economics dissertation turned out to be very useful in structuring the problem and thinking about it. It also turned out to be very useful with respect to the econometrics aspect of it and so on. But mainly it helped in, you know, so the reading was from sociology, et cetera, and organization theory and strategy. Uh, the structuring came from economics and the detail came from sheer fear, right? I had to do it well. And, and I, 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 will, I will qualify that. It wasn't just simply fear. I will come back, maybe if we get a chance to talk about uh, what I call local and global ambition. I'll come back to that. But uh, these three things together meant that I really tried to do everything very diligently. I also, which is practical of practical use to hopefully others, is I, I pulled down the dissertations of several people uh, including Ranjay, Kolwant, etc., all of whom had done very well. And uh, I used them literally as modeling tools. That's what I looked at, and then I, I did that. So I, I tried to deliver on, on that aspect of it. And that said, I think the impact really came when, uh, so I, I mean, one is part is timing. The network thing was taking off, so there is that timing aspect also, right? So the, again, I had to give credit to the three people because they, knew that I didn't see that, they told me. And, and I, I believed them, that's all I did. The, uh, on that side, the, the, the other aspect was that in this Im, you know, impact story, uh, I, I lost the chain of my thought there for a second. Uh, yeah, so then basically I, I, I get into this networks thing, I'm, I'm building on, you know, I'm, I'm doing my best on this dissertation. I turn out this paper, the paper goes on to win these awards. Okay, that's, you know, luck and whatever else you want to call it. Okay. Um, and then I submit it to ASQ, the first paper. And it comes back with some massive, you know, very sort of touch and go reviews. One was extremely nastily negative. Two were, you know, saying, well, basically, this is not much. You know, this is not going to go. And that was shocking to me because it's a paper that has won various awards at this point in time. And uh, essentially, it was Don Palmer who decided that he was still going to ask me to revise and resubmit it, even though uh, I, based on those reviews, I could easily, and as an editor today, I can tell you, I could easily have said, you know, reject it. And uh, the interesting thing was, my first reaction was, this is sheer, this is a, unbelievably bad, right? In the sense that, is it people taking it out on me because now I won these awards? Is it that you know, you get the narrow like feeling that people don't just get your genius at all, right? You, you look for every self-justifying uh, explanation for why this was there. And if I'd stayed with them, the story could have had a different ending. But again, the survival instinct kicked in. And I said, look, whatever be the motivations of the reviewers, those are irrelevant to me. What matters is they have to sign off. And if you want to stay in this profession, that's what you got to do. And so I took a long, long time, addressed every component of every, you know, uh, comment. And in that process, I actually discovered research. 
that it wasn't what I was doing. It was the art of framing to actually recognize. So one thing that I kept asking myself, how could this paper win these awards and then come up with, you know, why are these guys still pushing me to say, what is the organizational puzzle here? But once I framed the puzzle in that sense, if you look at that paper, to me, the most important thing is I began writing a paper on innovation and that's what I submitted. The review process forced me to make it a paper about networks where innovation was just a context for a more general principle. And that would never have happened but for the review process. And in, in that sense, if I have to give credit to somebody, I have to give it to those three reviewers who really pushed me to clarify what it was that I had discovered and why they should or any organizational theorist should care about it. And in that process, I truly learned what research was about and I fell in love with the concept of abstraction. And that's where, uh, that's been the, the story of, of life thereafter. So, so let's talk about the story of life thereafter, right? So, I mean, you know, you obviously you have this kind of stream of work you continued with your work with Francisco and Will, thinking about networks, et cetera. But you've also done, you know, these all these seminal papers thinking about innovation. More recently, you've done work on institutional strategies, influence rents. Uh, and then I know, uh, you know, some fascinating new stuff thinking about financial markets and innovation. And so how do you, I think, and we actually had this question from some one of the audience members as well. How do you think about when you're starting a new stream or you're starting a new project, how do you think about that? What, what inspires it? How do you decide what projects to go after? Yeah, so I think the first time around, as I explained, was pure accident, whatever I got led to. Thereafter, that gave me some freedom to actually choose things. And in some respects, the, you know, the, so for instance, if I take specific cases, the institutional thing came out of uh, uh, my own experiences. I, you know, I'm, I grew up in India and then I come to the United States. India is going through a process of market institution development. And uh, I took some time off, uh, you know, a sabbatical and I went to India, I was walking around trying to see how market institutions are developing there. And uh, essentially what I did was I ran a mental regression between how I saw things working in the United States and how I thought, saw things working in India. And there were a couple of components to this mental regression that were kind of important. Uh, one was, uh, you know, it came out of the teaching side of things. And, you know, in my last session, and uh, I used to teach the core strategy class, I would say, uh, you know, imagine that you have, it was a way to try and integrate the learning so I said, imagine that on the left-hand side, you have a regression equation. On the left-hand side, you have uh, a ton of, uh, you know, all the, some performance metric for every firm in the world. And on the right-hand side, you have these four boxes that we had instruction in, industry effects, firm effects, you know, global, you know, uh, corporate effects, which could be global or uh, multi-business, and execution. What proportion of the variance do you think would be explained by each of these four boxes? Okay, in this mental exercise. Uh, and invariably, my MBA class, which probably reflects how much emphasis we put on various things in our teaching, would say industry structure, because five forces is something they carried away very clearly, right? And then what I would do is I would uh, put down a list of the top 50 companies in the world or the top 500, you know, distribution of the top 500. And something would immediately jump out. Remember, these were the mid nineties at that point in time, was that the United States and then Western Europe dominated these lists. I said, if the question I have for all of you is, if geography matter, matters for so little, if, if where you are matters for so little, why would these lists be like that? You know, the observed distribution should be very similar to the, uh, you know, this, we're seeing that on the selection and if you look at the success part, uh, size is a met metric of success, uh, you see a completely different world. And that began an exploration into what I looked at as the institutional basis of comparative advantage. Okay. And uh, a lot of the students told me that they actually found that uh, class alone 
worth more than the entire course. <laughs> because uh, I, I tried to structure the argument and, you know, I, I usually teach three hour classes. So it's kind of, you know, you have the time. And I walked through and it, and that's when I realized that people simply managers or people training to be managers and subsequently I've learned managers of all types simply do not give enough credit to the role of institutions or even understand it. And that's what led me to that, you know, to that paper that I wrote, which was really right. a paper that was, uh, it was an emotional sort of, you know, if you think of something as a labor of love, that was probably the closest. It's one of the papers that is least cited amongst all my work, but it was one stream of consciousness, almost 80 pages long, because there were other incidents that happened also, which showed me that we make all this hue and cry about how you make more money. Yet the easiest way or the most important way that firms make money is by controlling the rules of the game. Right. And, and there were some very, very salient features of what I saw happening which were very disturbing to me. And that's why the, the, the paper does have a darkish tone as more than one reviewer, you know, as both the reviewers pointed out as well. But, but that's, that's part of the thing. So that's, that's very, so where do I, I so the, back to your main question. So where do I, I find uh, questions from? So let me frame it in a way that is actually practically useful. First of all, um, I do look at passions now things that I, but remember my, some of my passions are born simply out of expertise or at least depth, if not expertise. I've looked at innovation in networks, so it goes there. I really enjoy abstraction. So I look for ways to, where I can play with that abstraction of every kind, whether it's theoretical development or thinking about how to capture some phenomenon through a, a, a good construct, highly construct valid measure. Okay. But the third part, more recently what I've done is, and this is where the, you know, the financial markets, et cetera, is, uh, I step out and look at the world and say, what are the big changes happening in the world? And what, do, what implications for strategy research might they have? And more narrowly, within the areas that I have competence in, is there some way I can un unfold this so it can be useful to, to you? Right? So that's where that financial markets thing comes from, is that if you look at the financial markets over the last 20 odd years, uh, there is a set of regularities. Ownership has changed from, uh, you know, sort of retail investors and uh, what do you call active investors to passive investors. That's a massive change. We know that uh, we often frame many things in our strategy class by saying, uh, you know, but the shareholder is paramount or, you know, how does this affect the shareholder? But it turns out that over the last 20 years, the shareholder is not the primary provider of capital to U.S. corporations. It's the debt holder. So that opens up a whole stream of, of work, which is again, part of what I'm, I'm looking at or pursuing, okay? So uh, the idea here then is that we would, uh, you know, so, the, so two or three things. One, I look at problems in the world around me and see what can be a way that I can use. So alliances fits that pattern. It was something that is very current in institutions fits that pattern. Uh, it was salient to me at least. And the third part here is this, uh, you know, the, uh, the third shift is the financial markets, etc. It just turns out there are five, uh, you know, sort of trends I identified about five years ago. I've been sort of building a research agenda around them. Three of them tend to be end, end up being financial as opposed to otherwise, but uh, that is purely, you know, where I look kind of thing here. I want to go back to, uh, you know, the discussion, I mean, the, the, the story about the institutional um, strategy piece uh, and think a little bit, talk a little bit. I mean, since, you know, you're, you're both a, 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 a star researcher and a star educator, how do you think about the relationship between those two roles that, that we all in some sense play? Uh, you know, how does teaching inform research? How does research inform teaching, et cetera? Yeah. See, uh, uh, first of all, uh, a, a notable thing about my um, research and teaching portfolio is that uh, the, I have almost never taught anything that is close to me in a research setting. Okay. Uh, but even for 12 years, I served as chair of the Michigan Strategy Group, and therefore, uh, you know, as a chair, I was basically assigning myself residual you know, 
the last thing that you know as a chair is basically you, what nobody else wants to do is what you're stuck with. So there were people who were willing to do, teach technology or innovation and so on and so forth. And nobody wanted to do a second class in strategy with all the old rehashed material from you know, the first class in strategy. And so that was my, my uh, thing. And, and for 12 years, it kind of stayed that way. So the idea is uh, uh, purely as an, you know, as an exogenous, semi-exogenous uh, shock, my research and my teaching did not have an overlap, right? So the, right. So the question is, how then did I, how would I, so I would serve as kind of a quasi-experiment of, uh, you know, one kind, which is what is, uh, what, what, how can they have an impact when you're not teaching what you're researching and vice versa? So I found that for me, the spillovers have largely been from research to teaching, but not in the sense of specific research findings. It's in the process of abstraction. So, and that I have found there is a market for. There is a market for it in the MBA classes. There's a market for it in the executive education. And there's a market for it at the highest level of CEOs. I, so, so I think the first thing I took away was this notion of abstraction. And how do I actually play it in the classroom is the following. Is that uh, cases can be discussed in two ways. One is that you, uh, you have a very rich discussion which leads to a perspective development and so on. And the other is that somewhere you eventually end up developing an underlying model from the case. So case selection is very critical to that. Okay. And uh, uh, I've done it both ways, depending on the audience. But uh, what I've found is that this ability to abstract, or at least this passion for abstraction, allows you to make that last call, which says to them, okay, I didn't just learn something about Tesla today, or I didn't just learn something about, you know, GE today. Here is something I can take back and apply in a structured fashion to any problem I might see later on in life. So, and I think that that was one, one, one part of it. And that, that was, uh, that is what, uh, what came through. And it usually requires extra effort and so on to make that happen. Okay. But uh, I was never one that cared too much about the incentive system very directly. And so uh, I was able to put in that kind of effort and that is where it, it came from. Uh, from teaching to research, I have had uh, individual hypotheses that have come in. Uh, you could also argue that the most current uh, iteration of my research agenda, it's not that the questions came from teaching, but for teaching, I was staying abreast of the financial markets as right. they crashed and went through all of that, crashed and burnt and so on. Um, and that made me, you know, made several trends in those markets salient to me. And as a strategy person, I could engage with them and I would get the idea that, look, I can actually use this in, in my research. And that's how it worked. Okay. Uh, another word, a caution that I will attach, I find, and this is partly to do with my department chair role, what I found was that people who were actually specialists in the field, uh, when they taught that field, they were often not that successful because their research capabilities led them to often be so nuanced that the learning was perceived to be very narrow. Right. We, as researchers, we, to do a good job, we really refine things in terms of asking questions. So we eventually get the equivalent of a brick, but the brick is of no use to the manager or the student. They want to build a structure, I want to see what the structure looks like. And for that, therefore, if you are going to be successful, my conjecture is working in a research area of your own, you have to presume, I always presume, that my entire research output of my life could at best give me one session in a, in a course. Right. The rest has to come from the, from the village. And that's, you know, yeah. the part there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, now that uh, you've, I do want to move on to thinking about other things, but I, you know, as you look back at your career uh, from from the vantage point of you know your success today, what would be something you know either as a PhD student or as an assistant professor, what would be something you wish you had known then that you know now? See, that's a that's a wonderful question. Uh, but, I'm going to make a, I'm going to parse it a little bit though. I think I knew most of what was required very 
soon. You learned those. Those things are not dramatic. The point is how you use them, right? So here is the, here is the thing. Uh, I know today, and it gets hammered every day in some form or the other, that publication matters. <laughs> Is at the margin. I think that's a fairly fair assessment that when push comes to shove, the institutions we all work for are very clear about it, right? right? At times that can be very hurtful. I've had to deliver that message and I've had to receive that message. Okay. Uh, my first three years, you will see that there are no publications, you know, in, you know, in my thing. And, and you can imagine going up for a contract renewal without a publication. Uh, it was, uh, again, the good offices of the UT group, which basically concluded that, and they actually, one of them told me is that we like you. We think you're a smart guy. You work very hard because you're here, you know, pretty much anytime, anywhere, anytime. In fact, to the extent that I was actually given the key to the department by the security guys, because they figured <laughs> that I would get to you know, I would be more likely to get to a situation faster than them. That was one of the most hilarious things in my life because people were supposed to lock the door before they left the office door and somebody would forget. And in the end, I would have to call in the, uh, you know, the, uh, the guys to, to lock it. Right. And because there were three different doors and I didn't have keys to all three of them. I only had keys to my own door, uh, my side of it, of the building. And uh, the fourth or fifth time the same guy came, he said, you know what, you're always here. Why don't you just keep cold keys? So I don't have to keep coming. Yeah, okay. So, so it was very clear that, uh, you know, the, the, the incentive system was very clear. What I am uh, happy about is that for one reason or another, I didn't pay attention to it. It has given me a tremendous amount of satisfaction that I have, uh, been appreciated in the classroom and even more so to know that I have done the right thing by, by the students, right? And that would never have happened in the normal human, if I had hewed to the normal in this thing. In fact, uh, an incident there is probably useful. So it was my third year in Texas. I had zero publications. And keep in mind that whenever I say Texas, remember I joined with Jim Westfall, who at this point was batting <laughs> on 12 ASQs alone, okay? So they, they see we brought these two guys in, one has 12 ASQs and the other guy is still like figuring out how to get out of zero uh, of any type. Uh, and, and you can see the, the pressure there. Right. And as luck would have it, I, I also won the, the, you know, the student voted award for the third time. And I was coming back with the award in my hand and I ran into two of my senior colleagues in the, uh, so one of them jokingly said, oh, here comes the overachiever. And the other colleague said something which stayed with me very importantly. He said, yes, it would be nice if he actually knew what to overachieve on. <laughs> and, and I fully agree with the person who said this. I think that, you know, the person was looking out for me. They made, they made the right call. Hmm. But my take was that, you know, this is what I have understood of this job. And at this point in time, I had developed enough confidence in myself to say that, you know what? I won't make tenure. I will get a job somewhere. Okay. And I'm going to continue to do this as I, as I go forward with it. And I think connected to this is the other construct that I mentioned earlier, which is this notion of local versus global ambition. See, from my perspective, uh, you know, and it's horrible coming from a person who teaches strategy is a prime, you know, line this thing. <laughs> See, I, I, I talk, I think about global ambition as the idea that you want to be something, somebody, some level of aspiration that you want to achieve. You know, I want to be a successful professor. I want to be a successful researcher. Uh, and that has never been a part of my life. I have never cared about being a famous professor or a successful one. So clearly, if you think of ambition from that perspective, that didn't make any sense to me because I know that I'm also very ambitious. So I spent some time thinking about what is it that is really the focus of my ambition? What am I trying to do? And that's when I introduced the construct of local ambition. See, I have no goal or desire to be the best teacher or the best professor or the best researcher or the richest guy or the guru. But I do have loads of what I call local ambition. That, and local ambition is best captured in the idea that if I'm doing something, I want to do it to the absolute best of my ability with no compromise, right? It may not be very good in an absolute sense, but I will know 
that I did the best I could have done. And no man can do that, right? And, and that, that really has been the driving force. So when I've taken on, you know, when you asked me that I got that review back from ASQ, yeah. it was a brutal review. And some parts of it were so brutal that the editor said that you are being held to an unfair standard because nobody in the field has done this and it cannot be done. So you should not be held to that. You can ignore those points. Nevertheless, I said, I will try and I did address them and including by creating simulations and so on and so forth. And I did address that simply because that was part of what my DNA was. It was also, and that's where I think the local ambition and the fear coincided because I had to get it done uh, to make it work. So I think that has been very, very important to me. And I think it might be useful to argue also, or, or you know, I've also speculated on why uh, I have so much of drive, but so little global ambition, right? And part of that I think is, is a historical thing. See, I was, uh, I lost my father when I was at the age of five, okay? And uh, we got evicted from our home two weeks after that. And the next 18 years were a fairly interesting time period, as you can imagine, uh, in a country like India where there is no social security and, and support network and so on. So the notion that there would be a tomorrow that I could plan for was impossible. Today was all that mattered. Somehow I had to survive today to get to tomorrow. Right? Right. And <clears throat> in, in those circumstances, the notion of you know, saying, I want to be this, that, or the other, that makes no sense. All you can really do is that today, if there is going to be a cut made, I'm going to be on the correct side of that cut. Right. And And that's the part that I would really, you know, share is that you can't really control what the world does with you at the end. All you can control is what do you do to the world? And if you can do the best, at least you don't have a regret that I could have done something else. Right. Yeah, and I, and I mean, I think, again, I think, you know, your, your story, and thank you for sharing that. I think your story really speaks to the idea that I mean, again, I, I would say this is actually a strategy thing, right? I think the the idea that you pick the one thing you're really good at and you really sort of do that to the max and that's how you actually achieve global success, right? You don't, you right? I mean, go back to Porter, right? This is kind of yes. making choices and focusing on things, right? So, so uh, thank you. Um, so uh, I want to switch gears a little bit and, and you know, uh, you know, I'm thinking a little bit about sort of your role as editor in chief at organization science, uh, which, you know, obviously gives you a sort of unique vantage point on, if, if you will, the, the sort of flow of research in our field at this moment. Uh, what are some things that, you know, I, sort of stepping away from your own research, thinking about the field what are some things that you are, you know, excited about either methodologically or topic wise or in any way? And what are some things that concern you about where the field is headed or seems to be headed? So I think I'll, I'll begin with things that I think are, you know, really exciting and into the, you know, this thing. And I only worry about, uh, so I'm going to place a caveat first because people will often read more. See, I have like two minutes to answer this question. So I'm going to pick a couple of things. Right. That doesn't mean that the other things are not important, right? At the margin, pushing forward knowledge is important in, in all spheres that we, we do. So I'm going to only say, here are a couple of big broad theme areas, but that should not guide what you do. You should be doing what you are interested in doing. And that's, that, that says, goes without saying, right? But I think that the entire world, of, you know, the, the obvious things seem to be the most exciting ones the way the world has taken on a digital spin, it affects almost everything we do, right? And we've seen it in, you know, the form of the protests and so on. It's affecting the social dimension of things, it's affecting business in a hundred different ways. And much of what we know can be applied to those areas. And that yields knowledge, but a lot of what, they, what is possible, you know, is something we haven't even thought of. So I think 
that exploration is a very important one. That's what, what drove my own departure from Michigan and coming to Cornell is that the idea that I wanted to learn about this digital space and how it might interact with the world. And, and that those are things that, that are really very, very important. Uh, so I think uh, for doctoral students starting out right now, this is an incredible time, right? Because first of all, they have the ability to develop what I call a digital approach to thinking or a digital mindset. I don't have that. I don't think I can acquire it. I'm trying hard, but it will never be as good as, as those that, that grew up in this, right? So my best hope is to use complementarities, things that I know about and can help those that are, are more digitally oriented, okay? So that's, that's one part of this, uh, uh, this uh, you know, setup is that the digital stuff is, is really key. Uh, it also has a has a data dimension because you have these incredible skill sets possible now, and those are very exciting. On the methods front, I think it's uh, there's been a wonderful revolution. All of you are familiar with it. I think we are all being forced to become, uh, you know, harder in terms of looking at what we can do, in terms of making calls and claims, etc. So I think those are important, and and I don't think any journal can um, afford to not be there on that. The Fourth part though is, uh, is a little worry I have, is that uh, we sometimes put the cart before the horse. Our field has always been one where the lack of a dominant paradigm enabled us to experiment and think in terms of theories that were not so rigidly defined as to have to be formally laid out and, and so on and so forth, right? So that's why I would say that it was in 1973 that Granovetter wrote about weak ties in getting a job. And in 1995, an economist writes about that. You know, so that's the 20 year lag you can, you can say is that it allowed us to think in ways that were different. So I think it's very important for us to retain our uh, identity as a field and not be completely beholden to the methods part alone or to be beholden to a particular way of thinking alone. We, it's, we should have absorbed those, those methods uh, you know, and so on and so forth. But we should also experiment and do things that we need, need to be doing. Most importantly, we need to think about theory and abstraction. And that's why organization science has put down its own sort of line in the sand on that, is that uh, you, can be, you can have an outstanding empirical piece, but if it doesn't push theory, it's unlikely to make it through. Right. You can have an outstanding theoretical piece, which has very flawed theory with very flawed empirics. We'll force you to acknowledge those empirics being flawed but we will say, you know what? Data theory and methods all coming together at the same time is a happy coincidence. If it didn't happen, you gave us at least one of the three. Let somebody else build on this, but let's move. Right. So I think those are the things I would, I would push. Yeah. So um, uh, Gautam, we are getting close to the time when I want to open this up for Q and A, but let me ask a couple of other questions that I, just because I'm curious, right? So. Uh, so you, you know, you, you live in New York now and you've been kind of at the heart of this pandemic, apparently becoming indifferent to chocolate, which is the most terrifying thing I can think of. Um, what, what do you think, if at all, are the, are the, do you see as the implications of this moment we're living through, either in terms of, you know, in modes of instruction or in terms of research, etc., for uh business schools if any going forward and i don't mean you know obviously there's going to short term disruption but i think sort of longer term do you see this affecting our profession our field in some fundamental way yeah my take is that if it if history is a guide i mean obviously it will have some effect so let's take the instruction part first uh it will have some effect but in part how much of an effect it has is going to be in part driven by how long, how long this thing, this crisis mode stays, right? Because we find that human habits change very, uh, uh, you know, very slowly. And if you're used to something, you'll relapse to it. Uh, we're also learning through this that there is a value to, uh, to what we would call, uh, you know, in-person interaction. That it is not just about pure learning, it is about the context of learning, it is about the human aspects of learning, it's about the social process of learning also that, that makes education important. Right? And that serves to me as a kind of, you know, I think that going forward, uh, I mean, to some extent, some stuff will move online. The most sort of 
basic stuff in the sense that that is algorithmic, right? You can, right. you can have a video and that does the job. But increasingly, if you have to think about uh, what I, you know, about creative and conditional sort of thinking, that is where you would expect a change in the, in the emphasis. I strongly suspect though that the economics of business schools and universities are gonna be very sig significantly affected. So there will be a shakeout and that will be a, will be a problem. Uh, but uh, clearly I see uh, some composition changes, but for the most part, I actually expect that a lot of what we did will change in how we deliver things, but not in a massive way. We will, we will still be there and we will still be. So I think these calls that the university is now done for because you can you know, have one person teach everybody, it doesn't work that way. Right. Human nature doesn't, you know, human beings don't function that way. So that's one part of it. From a research perspective, in the short run and in the medium term, I expect that it will have a negative effect in one way and a positive in the other. And the positive is that it gives us something to study. Uh, all our colleagues here love shocks. So well, we've got the mother of all shocks here. <laughs> and you can see, and I can see as, uh, you know, as uh, the editor that the papers are flowing in on the shock, yes. like nothing is tomorrow. But the, uh, I think in, in a deeper sense, we do have a problem. Because innovation or knowledge creation is a fundamentally collegial, collective, collaborative exercise. And to the extent that we stay away from each other, that is going to be affected. The second thing is productivity is going to be affected negatively in this as in every other business in the world, because a large part of what we do, uh, we cannot do with the full force of our energy because part of energy is diverted prospect of death may focus the mind, but it also is scary, right? Uh, so uh, Samuel Johnson, I don't know if he had lived through the plague, but he, would, he might need to change his statement a little bit there. But uh, the other part of it is that the, this kind of, uh, you know, the, the collaborations that we are looking for, I mean, they don't happen, but the productivity also declines because we're being forced to do things that we are not good at. We don't eat out, we don't, you know, we don't dry clean stuff, we don't do all those things which are small things, but which make specialization, uh, you know, which give you the productivity effects of specialization. And that's been, that's a part of everything. So I expect that to have a two to 5% effect on the GDP per se, and we are not immune from that. So I think we will have that too. So last question before we open it up for Q&A, uh, and this is actually more Samina's question, but I, I know she'll fire me if I don't ask it. So, um, so Samina, you'd like to ask, uh, you know, what is, who is your outside? And I'm going to caveat this with outside of research, outside of, uh, you know, our field. Who is your favorite writer or your favorite book? So what do you find kind of inspiring to read? Uh, that's, that's wonderful. You know, here is the, here is the thing. And I go back to something you said earlier, you said that my local ambition strategy was really a specialism, you know, a specialization strategy and what you're good at. Right. Right. So there are two parts to this that I will tell you. The first is that through the first 27 years of my life, I read an average of multiple books a day, maybe three books a day. Okay. And at one point of time, you, you're from India. So you know that in India, quizzing was a big thing. You know, you were like, right. you had all these things. And I was for, um, you know, we never had a formal national championship, but they, the closest that they were, I was a winner several times over. So I was incredibly broad in my reading. Okay. So, uh, uh, but that's the first 27 years of my life. In the last 20 odd years of my life, since I joined academics, I have practically not read anything. Okay, so I am very disappointing as an individual because I'm saying that I, outside the field, I have done nothing. And, and so I don't have a favorite author anymore. I don't have a, you know, a, a, anything that I can, I, can, I can tell you about. I have, uh, you know, uh, I will say though that on occasions when my students ask me, what were the three greatest achievements of the human intellect that I would turn their direction to, uh, turn their attention to. And I always have maintained that uh, the three, and, and I'll let the order, you have an order, I have my own order. Uh, so the first clearly is essentially Einstein's contributions to relativity and you know, physics more broadly, because they opened up worlds that we would never have seen. 
The second is Shakespeare's collective works, which I did read as a kid. You know, and, you know, when I was 15 to 25, I, I read all the 37 plays. Uh, uh, the, uh, because for their, they give you insight into the human condition. Because 400 years later, they still make an incredible amount of sense. But I think that the most important uh, uh, human sort of intellectual achievement that I would draw people's attention to, uh, and I do that in the classroom, is to look at the US Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. Uh, because it is my take that in a world driven by those principles, you will always find an Einstein or a Shakespeare or multiple of them. But that those are the most important uh, achievements of human talent. And I have no idea how 200 odd years ago, a bunch of not necessarily very well read people came up with so much wisdom. Right. But it is spectacular. And if you think about the permanence of that document, they wrote down things 200 years ago. And in all the collective wisdom, we have made 14 changes to them. I mean, there are 26 amendments, but the first 12 of them were part of the ratification process, including the Bill of Rights. So if you think about, that was not the world they lived in. It's not the world we live in today because you can see it outside your door, but it is nevertheless a world to aspire for. I, I'm totally speechless by that. So I'm going to pass it on to Q&A and let other people ask you questions. Uh, I know we have a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, so why don't I, uh, why, I'm, I'm just going to ask you, I'm not going to try to read other people's questions out. I'm just going to call on you and ask you to, to, uh, to, to unmute yourself and ask us the question directly. Uh, so, uh, and, and actually before we do that, uh, I'm reminded now, uh, can we, maybe just take a quick uh, snapshot just to capture everybody who's uh, here. Uh, so if you, if you feel comfortable doing that, if you could uh, uh, turn on your video so we can kind of see your faces as opposed to seeing this kind of wall of black. Uh, let's take a, maybe a 10 seconds to do that. Uh, uh, of course, if you don't want to do that, that's fine. Uh, and then we'll take a picture. Uh, okay, I'm going to count down from three and then I'm going to take a picture. So everybody smile. Uh, uh, one, two, three. Perfect. Uh, okay, uh, so then uh, I'm going to call on, I'm going to call in people in the chat to ask questions. Uh, you can also, if you want, raise your hand uh, and I can call on you uh, on there as well. Uh, so either of those options is fine. But I'm going to start with, I'm just going to do this in order. So I'm going to start with Carolyn, uh, who had a question about uh, so net research and social networks. Carolyn, you? Yeah, I'm here. Hi, everybody. So um, I'm in my first year of PhD, so I'm just starting my journey. And I am interested to know where you see the future of social networks research is going or what are the prominent areas to look at in social networks research, because that's the area um, of my interest at the moment. And I would just like to get it right the first time. Thank you. See, uh, here, are, here are a couple of uh, you know, things. One is that, remember, you want to pick a research topic. Uh, most research has sort of an S-shaped curve you know, you, it starts off slow and then it, you know, topic areas and then publications come in and then it suddenly takes off and it's the hot thing and then it sort of cools down. And it's kind of important to see that within the strategy and organization theory field, social networks has exploded for a long time now, okay? However, I see that this can be like, you know, we have in the technology strategy arena, you can have a succession of S-curves. Uh, to my mind, the existing or the available now infrastructure of technology allows us to map the concepts of social network theory with digital traces of people's lives that we would never have had before. There is work on that, but a lot of it is still very, very, you know, documentationally, you know, it's like, it's not using the full power of the theory or the approach. So I think that's where the next 10 years of work could be, uh, could be brought in and, and, uh, and worked on. So I think, Combining 
social network theory with digital traces of you know human you know uh, you know human settings where you have you know and, and the digital traces could be anything email social networks etc cetera, etc cetera. i'm not saying they don't have to be just social networks alone there are various ways that you can see people connecting to people so i think that is a very very important part of um, of of the thing that you could look at yeah and that that to me is a cottage industry it's going to be 10 years of work at least yeah right and actually with the pandemic it's even everything is truly online so like yeah it's even better um okay uh, I, i'm going to uh, op open it up to irene who had a question about you know uh, the publication process using the right editor etc so irene if you want to unmute and ask your question yes uh, can you hear me yeah yes um, so yeah, I, wa I was asking a question about how to choose an editor for a paper, the, the right editor for a paper, uh, because um, actually we are sending out a paper now and we, we were actually in doubt about choosing uh, an editor who is an expert of the methodology we use in the paper or either an expert of the topic we, we are tackling or either if we should uh, choose an, uh, an editor who is not an expert of the methodology or, or the topic, but that we, we know uh, because he told us that he appreciates the intellectual depth of the theoretical puzzle that we are developing in the paper. So, um, well, um, so this was a question and which is also linked maybe to the um, let's say the topic that we are hand, we are using in our paper which is um actually on it's a paper on brokering uh, but using a qualitative approach so we have these two um what? contrasting lens i don't know yeah. if no, that's fair enough i think the key thing to keep in mind is that uh, uh, if you, and i'm glad that you brought up the last part of it which is the qualitative versus the quantitative part uh, very likely, uh, I mean, it depends on the journal, but the editor will also make a call on this. So you can select somebody, but that's not necessarily what's going to happen. It will happen all the time, but not always. Uh, because editors have to also worry about capacity constraints. Some particular, you know, editor may not be available and so on and so forth. Uh, but they also have to worry about, you know, the fit. So in something like this, in general, I would say that if it's a qualitative paper, it's likely to go to somebody that's qualitative. Mm -hmm as an editor and uh, but if it's a quantitative paper uh, it would likely go to a person that's a topic expert so it would go to a networks person as opposed to somebody else uh, and because and that varies by journal as well at oak science where i am we basically focus very much uh, uh, the we focus on uh, the theoretical contribution so if it's a story about networks, you have to add something to the networks literature irrespective of what the methods are. And that a networks person should be able to see, right? Uh, if it's a very qualitative paper, they can still probably do it. They might have some concerns about the research method or their ability to handle it directly, but they will, you know, we also have a methods panel which will, which will help them in that respect. But again, the core idea will be, what are you contributing to theory, right? So it depends also on the journal, but at least for Oak Science, the theory or the topic will will dominate over the method. Okay. We have a research methods panel. If I get a paper on a topic which I'm not an expert on, uh, math methodologically, I can reach out to one of those experts and they can give me their opinion. But what contribution the paper makes is still my judgment, right? I have to evaluate that. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'm gonna actually change the order a little but since we are talking about you know journals and and framing and contribution uh deepak you had a question about you know uh you know framing papers for research so you want to just ask that sure uh so hello everybody and uh, first of all thanks to the organizers for uh, or organizing this session and thanks to professor ahuja as well uh, so i i'm from temple university and i'll be beginning my third year very sh shortly um, so I work with uh, Professor uh, Vivek Tandon and uh, he kind of swears by Professor Ahuja's knack of kind of framing these questions, uh, framing the questions as well as paper in a way that 
it actually sounds journal quality so i just wanted to learn or maybe understand how to build that skill and uh, you know use it in my that's yeah i think that's a very very difficult question to answer in in especially in a in a short uh, format but the general technique i have used is i step back and say theoretically what do we know about this topic and by that i say i look at the three papers that would be closest to what you've done okay and i say theoretically what have those three papers contributed and how do you build on that and then i ask myself is that a sufficient contribution how is it connected to that and that's how the the framing occurs is because your paper should appear as the natural next step of the ladder of knowledge we are climbing right and that natural aspect means that your literature review doesn't have to be 40 papers in the end i want to know what are the three papers closest to what you studied irrespective of whether they look like what you did or not and i want to build a tree of knowledge where does that, that is the main branch and then you've got the smaller branches and so on that's the way i use it and that's the way i uh, i look to frame frame things up okay it's happy to chat about this at some other time with you know actual illustrations and so on but i don't think today's time frame will will leave that yeah. thank you so much so uh, gotham um since we are talking about and you know and we didn't really get to cover this so i'm going to interject and and actually which macadog isn't here uh, but usually he i was going to wait for him to ask this question but since he's not here i'm going to channel him and ask it uh so you know you've had so many really successful doctoral students over the years uh you know what is the what would be the sort of what do you think is the core piece of advice that you give them uh you know when when you work with them that you think is valuable it's again a good question i'm not sure there is a single core piece of advice i think it's uh, um, you know I, they become a part of my life very dramatically so they are you know they they see a lot of uh, you know everything i talk about i i i share every part of it i you know i overshare i guess in general so that's part of it but uh, some of the things that i really push them to do is to develop their own self so you know there are different models of people working with people sometimes people will say okay you know i'm working on this and you join me as a doctoral student and you know you work with it and then you write your dissertation and then we'll write papers together from that uh, my model is different i they're always welcome to work with me on what i do but i want them to work on their dissertation on what they are interested in and develop that separately and over a period of time i want them to uh, you know delink from me and, and go on so if you notice that i have a lot of students but i don't have large numbers of papers with any of them because most of them have sort of delinked and or at least they even if they have them with me they have them with many other people too because i believe that uh, if for their own development it's very important that they go out and uh, you know work with them in fact sometimes i feel that i have been uh, if anything i would i would correct that a little bit because there are uh, nuances in the publication process which are probably easier to discover with two or three papers that with somebody who's already done them and i my general thing of you know one paper i work with and then they move on has not been necessarily the most optimal structure partly because of my sort of overarching commitments to too many things there okay but to be your own person and uh, develop it focus on theory match the journal to the to the idea and so on yeah um okay uh, so i'm also going to you know we also had a question from uh, rasim about you know how do i mean since we're talking about collaborations with with your advisor you know rasim had a question about you know picking collaborators in more generally so rasim do you want to just ask that yeah before asking my question i uh, if you don't mind I, i want to thank to thank to him for sharing his life story it's it, i'm really touched by it it's not just a success story it's like a survival story uh so as junior researchers we are also trying to survive so and collaborations are really important and i want to ask to him i want to uh, ask what what would you recommend um in terms of collaborators choice in terms of dealing with collaborators so for instance should we go for more senior uh researchers or should we go someone like us Uh, so what what would you recommend indeed about collaborations in general yeah see i, I threw out a couple of thoughts there i mean obviously this is very highly conditional on the person and and their research agenda and so on 
uh, you will see that I have almost always collaborated only with my doctoral students. That's simply the largest, almost completely the, the, the bulk of my uh, collaborative work. Uh, I think collaborating with somebody senior is very, very important because research is uh, something that you learn by tutelage, you know, by being, uh, so it's not so much, uh, and there are so many subtleties so that, and that process is still full of tacit knowledge. So you, the back and forth of the papers is very critical. So you, you do something and your student does something and then the student comes back to you. So I think in that sense, working with somebody who knows uh, that field is, is very important as a collaboration. Uh, being personally comfortable with them is critical, right? So I would, I would say that, uh, you know, the, that is also very important. You want to be careful that your collaborations don't lead you astray on uh, in going in a too many directions because academics is a business of rewarding specialization. You cannot be the world's expert on 40 things or 20 things or three things or five things also. Maybe two or three, yes, over a period of time. But as a doctoral student, you want to be an expert on one thing. So for the first five, seven years of your career. So uh, that would imply that you, you know, you really focus deeply from people you can learn from and uh, that you can work with. People have different, I know people who are wonderful to learn from, but they have a very, very unique style and it may not be for everybody. So the working style is also important, but uh, it's a portfolio. Some juniors, some juniors with whom you develop parallel research interests and seniors whom, who can help you through the publication process. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, so I know we've skipped you a couple of times, but Liwe, uh, you had a question about, on, uh, you know, online education, versus in-class education, digital transformation of education. You want to just ask that? Um, thank you. Thank you, Asim. Actually, I have two questions. First, I wanted to thank you, uh, all the organizers and speaker for having this wonderful meetings. It's very nice to hear a touching personal story instead of just how to write a paper, how to generate <laughs> ideas. Uh, so my initial question was, uh, actually, I submitted the original question. I wanted, I, I, I noticed that uh, Guanam has so many papers across, one could say across different disciplines, across different topics, different disciplines. And, and I would like you, I would like to learn about your advice on uh, to junior scholars or even PhD students about uh, if, you, if one wants to cross different discipline or cover different topics, what, what would your suggestion be? And that's my first question, more research related. And the second question is, uh, is inspired by uh, Asim's last question about the future um, of online education. And we've mostly hearing about um, pre, uh, pre this pandemic uh, uh, time, we mostly hear about this fear of cannibalizing the existing education system by the online teaching. But what about the employer's perspective do they evaluate um, the online degree as much as uh, a regular degree, a traditional degree? That's something uh, actually I haven't heard about and I would like to uh, have uh, your input uh, on that. Okay, so the first part is your, if I understood your question correctly was, uh, how can PhD students and junior faculty, junior scholars uh, engage with a variety of topics, right? Learn about a way. My short answer is don't. You should not. Because that is, believe me, it is tough enough to do one thing and to do it well. You try to do two or three things in your doctoral program or in the first five years of your career. A second thing generally is a good idea to start off. A third is a little bit more questionable and multiple and, and because you have to present a cohesive picture of who you are. You might wonder why is it important that we see a cohesive picture? It's because academics eventually is a business of depth. To be able to uncover something, you have to go very deep in it. And given the constraints of time and human intellect, you cannot go deep into multiple things. So at least my advice very strongly would be stick with one thing and do that well. Okay. On the issue of how employers will value uh, online education, I suspect that as with most things, it's going to vary by the nature of the knowledge and the nature of the subject. If it is algorithmic kinds of things which can be taught in a technical fashion. Uh, so basically, if you're going to be a, you know, uh, 
an accountant or something, if you're going to do very sort of laborious work, the very detailed work, that may be okay, the online degree will be fine for. But where, you, where there is judgment required, where there is breadth of knowledge required, where there is an interpersonal component required, see, employers are looking for people who can handle problems and who can handle people. They're not looking for a body of knowledge. The body of knowledge is only a way to, a signal of what you can do. So if you are able to, you know, the online degree doesn't give us very good ideas of what you would be and managing a team, right? So those kinds of things of a managerial and higher level occupations, my suspicion is that the college and the work, you know, is a good uh, training ground for the workplace and that's not going to disappear. Your college, even your socializing is a way to build networks and to understand what are acceptable and unacceptable forms of behavior, right? Because there is a code to how people behave and, and I think those things are not gonna get taken away. So. Uh, if you're working in some very remote sort of specific, narrowly defined job, that's one thing. But for all higher jobs, which is the kind of jobs we train for, I expect that people will still require, uh, you know, uh, some indicators of uh, how you've done. And, and there is a skill set you pick up from being in college. Okay. So uh, you would, uh, I would not change my college exposure for any other period of my life. So I think that there is that definitely uh, a, a learning there, which I, uh, I got, which I would not have gotten. The random arguments you have with people, they're all developing both your personality and your intellect. Uh, Gautam, um, since we are talking about, you know, education and online and, and, and different education models, you know, I'm, I'm curious, as you mentioned, you know, Cornell Tech is a, is a, in itself a very different sort of model, right? I remember you telling me you don't have an office, you have a desk. Mm -hmm. uh, which you share with people. So, um, you know, how is that? What has that been like? And, and, and do you think there's, do you think, I mean, I don't want to make this an advertisement for Cornell Tech, but, you know, do, do you think that's kind of a different future for business schools with this more collaborative model? I think there will definitely, there's, I mean, as with everything else, once a size doesn't fit all. Right. Uh, there are, multiple components of that model. I think the desk or the absence of it is a relatively small, it's symbolic, but substantively limited component. My take is that uh, the, the core value proposition of Cornell Tech is bringing together computer scientists, business people, the, the training process. So there's both a selection and a treatment effect. The selection effect is the people who are, we have a tech MBA, but the people who are selected for it are different from how we select our regular MBA people. At the same time, there's a treatment effect because we also offer a computer science degree and a connective media degree and so on and so forth. And a certain part of the project work, which is real actual work for companies and, and startups is done together by cross-functional, you know, cross degree teams. So you have to have a computer scientist working with a business school person and vice versa. And I think those are really fascinating ways that you, you will, you're going to see the progress. And I can see it in, in, in how I, when I talk to these kids and how they, they come up with, uh, you know, completely amazing ideas, which would never uh, struck me. And that's what, you know, led to my saying that I'm never going to be a completely digital person because I cannot, I see what these kids do, are capable of. And I know I, I can't do that, but I'm hoping that hanging around with them gives me some learning that I can, you know, and that's all I'm looking for. Yeah. So I think there are, uh, there are new models uh, that will be there, but you know, they not everything is a matter of, you know, integration across, Discipline. Right. But I think this idea is, is generally a powerful one that you have practice in terms of startups and large companies, you have computer science and you have business people all mulling around in the same space. And uh, that I think is, is, a, is a wonderful new model for at least some part of the economy. So yeah, a couple of other questions that, you know, focus on this sort of, if you will, the tension between speaking to a wide audience or speak generalizing across contexts and and, and being sort of more specialized. So uh, Jing Tang, you had a question. You wanna just take, ask your question? Oh yeah, um, thank you, Professor. Uh, I am a first year PhD student uh, in Granite Purdue University. So probably my question is a little bit uh, naive. And so I'm just kind of like uh, wondering that if we focus more on the right audiences, um, will that narrow down the influence of the of our works in the near future? So how how can we balance that kind of 
trade off. Yeah, thank you. Again, thank you. I'm going to give you an answer that you may not like, but my take is don't worry about influence right now. Okay. Just do a good piece of scholarly work and target it towards the people or the community in the academic, you know, subsetting that values it most. Once you have done enough of those, you will find that that builds up into impact. Impact is not something that you start. I still don't think about, oh my, is my paper going to have impact? And, you know, Asim mentioned all the citations. I had no clue that it was going to do that. I didn't care about that. All I wanted to do was keep my job. Okay. And, and so if job number one is to keep your job, focus on doing the best research you can on a narrowly specifically defined topic and make sure that you have understood or you, you will never understand them fully, but you are developing an understanding of the norms of that subgroup that focuses on that. And over a period of time, you will improve. Where you want to indulge your taste for variety is on the teaching front, pick something like a core class that will give you a broader ex exposure and force you to think more broadly about things. And then there can be a, a back and forth between your research area and, and this, but don't get too hung up with either impact or uh, what audience you need to have an impact on. The audience you need to have an impact is on three people, the three people who review your paper. And then we'll see what happens with the rest. Yeah. Okay. That's an issue for later in life. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, uh, we had a question that was posted. So, uh, uh, Hui Sun, uh, I don't know if I'm saying your name right. Uh, you posted a question about generalizing from uh, idiosyncratic and highly con contextualized institutional settings. Uh, I don't know if you want to ask that question directly rather than having me ask it. Uh, yeah, so sorry, I'm, I'm working from a, from a device. I don't have a, oh, uh, I don't have a video. So yeah. Um, so I think uh, when I asked that question, my thinking, uh, my thought process was institutional processes are so important, but at the same time, it's very difficult to generalize across contexts. And as you said, abstraction is one of the core um, components of research. So I wonder how you address these issues. See, abstraction is not necessarily only in generalizing. Abstraction means that you go and understand even a very narrow process or a very narrow slice of, of some organization or some function, but you characterize it in uh, conceptual terms. Okay. So what I mean by that is that we, when we look at, you know, innovation, patents are a measure of innovation, but how you connect innovation to patents is a conceptual exercise, right? In a given setting. So I think that's what I'm, I'm referring to when I say, that you need to have this passion for ab abstraction, which is that if I'm looking at patents, think about what it means for innovation more broadly and so on, but you don't have to generalize to very broad things itself. It has to be very narrow in, in terms of what it actually proves, but how you come up with that measure is kind of, you know, uh, it can, can give you benefits of abstraction. So for instance, uh, here's, here's one, uh, which I was just chatting about in the co uh, just, uh, uh, yesterday or day before, uh, you know, the uh, construct of technological preemption is a very narrowly defined product. It's like basically you file a patent or patent tickets, etc., that we talk about. Now, right, you file patents in an area which prevents others from, uh, you know, uh, sort of, or at least dissuades others from inventing in those areas because they worry about patent litigation and so on. Uh, a very simple, I mean, even though the, it seems like a very measurement oriented thing, how you conceptualize and measure it is itself an exercise in abstraction. So for instance, uh, what we came up with was essentially uh, thinking about a technological space, which is n-dimensional, where n is a very large number. And then we're saying what preemption man means is that you are the ticket means is that you have managed to squeeze all the mass in that space to a very small set of dimensions, right? And it turns out once you abstract it like that, uh, now the thing is, how do you map this on? Well, a simple way of mapping this on is to say that every citation in a patent is a separate dimension of knowledge. Now you have an infinitely or very large n dimensional space, but now you can use algebra, which says that this spanning vector in a space, which is the minimum number of dimensions in which you can express the matter in a space can be a met metric of 
uh, preemption, right? Because it's saying that even though there are all these things, most of it can be compressed into a, a small thing. So notice that's abstraction. It has nothing to do with the theory of, you know, uh, you know, generalizing to many other contexts, but it's this idea of being able to think in these terms. That to me is, is what I mean by abstraction. Okay. Uh, Abhi, you had a question. Uh, you want to ask that? Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Sorry, I'm in the middle of a move, so I'm not going to show you my apartment, which is filled with boxes. Uh, my question was, um, since you said you moved away from environmental sustainability and CSR type work, uh, is there any interest in returning to the topic? And how do you see the future of that topic and if you have followed it? Thank you. Uh, I think it, th this is a different time and, and age, and, and definitely there is a lot of value in, in work of that kind. And I think you can see that kind of happening. In fact, if you're interested in, in looking at it right now, just imagine what the pandemic is doing to our pollution scenarios, because we no longer go to stores to buy and we're paranoid about how that could, you know, things could be carrying germs inside. Companies are responding with all kinds of packaging, right? And that pollution, uh, that is going to emerge from all this packaging is going to change the world in a bad way, no matter what happens, right? So it's a very real problem and becoming, you know, with very more, much more important. And I think it's a lot more legitimate as a topic today than it was when I, I looked at it. So I don't intend to return to it simply because I don't have enough time or bandwidth, not because I don't have interest. I have had to discipline myself a lot because I, as my reference to my quizzing days would tell you, I, I routinely uh, studied every damn thing in the world that I could think of, right? Uh, I would spend time in a summer where I said, I'm going to go through Shakespeare's plays and I'm going through the quantum mechanics and I'm going to go through uh, British history, okay? So that's the way I was before I got into ac academics. But now I'm saying, you know what, that's fun, but uh, I need to do what I need to do. And, and so I think that this is a topic that's going to be very, very, uh, uh, you know, important. Uh, so I would all power to you. I'm just not going to engage in it because I've been left behind by the conversation now and I have difficulty enough keeping up with the conversations I'm in. So Gautam, um, you know, I, we started the conversation by mentioning, you know, I think this is a time when, uh, for especially I think for PhD students and for junior folks, it's been, you know, really stressful, both with the pandemic, but I think also with, you know, the the protests, with the, uh, I mean, as someone who uh, whose favorite reading is the Constitution, I think there's, I don't want to make this a political forum, but like, I think there's quite a lot of assaults on that and assaults on immigration and things like that, which have been troubling to those of us who, who are immigrants. Um, do you have any, I don't know, words of hope for... <laughs> For, for people, you know, as someone who's, you know, survived a lot in his life, like? See, uh, I think that's a wonderful question and I'm going to break it up into two parts. Uh, the first is words of hope, right? And I, I worry about those because clearly uh, I think that there is a pendulum and that pendulum swings back and forth. And the human spirit has always found ways to to sort of bring it together because eventually uh, there is, uh, you know, there, there is one path that doesn't lead to very good outcomes and another path that does. And you can temporarily go from one to the other, but in the long run, you, you have to look at the pros and cons in a more positive way. And I have confidence in, in, the, in my fellow men and, you know, fellow people across the world that they will make that happen, that there is fundamental decency and, uh, self-interest here, which will, will drive that. But, uh, you know, in, there's a wonderful line which President Obama has used in the past, but uh, which uh, is draws from people even before him, which says the, uh, the arc of justice, uh, you know, eventually it, it may be long, but it bends in the right direction. So I think that principle captures it. But for now, I think an important second aspect of it is that the arc may be long, but you have to live on a daily basis, right? And right now, some of the things that are most natural to us, like congregating with others, this virus very, very cruelly separates us, right? So what can you do that could help you with this? And I'll tell you what I have done. Now, I am always careful about giving advice about life because 
what works for me may not work for you because we are all creatures of our own, uh, you know, sort of uh, creation over time and, and something that may work for me may not work for you. So keep that in mind. But how have I dealt with this? Okay. Now, one of the things I realized in this pandemic has made me realize is that my number one resilience strategy through the more difficult periods of my life, I had forgotten about, or at least I was not engaging in. And that's a tremendous strength that you have because I am on the wrong side of the age curve for that strategy, which is dreaming. I'm not talking about aspirations. Aspirations are, you know, uh, the way I think about dreams is dreams are aspirations devoid of all chains of logic or constraint. You aspire to things that are in the remote possibility. You dream about things that are completely, you know, that have nothing to do with what you are. When I was a little kid, I used to dream. I knew I had zero talent for cricket, but I always used to dream every day, at least an hour and 45 minutes where I scored a new century. Uh, because that was my way of escaping. And it turns out that as you get older, it becomes very, very difficult to dream because the realities of life constrain you. And now when I've been here in this apartment for the last uh, four months, I literally have been walking six miles a day in this small New York apartment. You know, And if you think that's not an achievement, come and try it sometime because it takes all of two seconds to go from one end of my living room to the other. And what I have discovered is that even today, I have recovered my, uh, my zest for dreaming, for worlds that don't exist and will probably never exist. But there is that remote connection to reality. Uh, all that you need for a dream is not that it is probable or it is real, but that it is plausible. It is very, very important that it is not connected to what your immediate reality is. And I have found that to be a very, very uh, cheerful approach. It, it worked for me when I was a kid. I rediscovered it now because I don't have, the, you know, there are, there are all these things all around us which limit what else we can do. And I have come to the conclusion that that is an incredible asset that we have and that we should never give that up. It is our dreams that keep us young. It is our dreams that keep us hopeful. So I don't know if it helps you. I always worry that I can give you advice and then it doesn't really any make any sense to you. But don't worry about the realities of the real world. Dream, that's one thing I would say. The other thing I would say is that uh, don't watch too much of television. In, you watch Netflix. I think Samina's kids have given us the path Watch Netflix to your, uh, to your heart's desire, but don't watch the news. Don't watch <laughs> things that make you sad or depressed because misery feeds on itself. So ignore it, right? That world is going to happen irrespective of what you do. So don't kill yourself about it. Remember that somewhere in the end, that arc is still bending in the right way. And I don't mean it purely in a social justice setting. I mean it in a biological setting. I mean it in, I mean it in a broader, uh, broader setup. So, don't worry about that. Uh, and one of the things that I have found to be very useful, see, I went to, uh, same as Asim, we shared the same institution, it's a place called Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, which was created by this wonderful architect called Louis Kahn. It's a very unique uh, architect, uh, architecture. He has this wonderful line, which I have always found very inspiring. He says, uh, as an architect, he says, even a brick wants to be something. And how have I interpreted it? What I have interpreted it as is people around you. We live in a world of people, right? People around you want to feel good. You want to feel good. One of the easiest ways to feel good about yourself is to be, do good for somebody else. It doesn't matter who, because that increases our self-esteem. It gives us confidence. Confidence gives us hope and it gives us resilience. So the more isolated you are, as this virus is making us, the more important it is to think of acts of kindness that you could have done or would like to do for others, or simply be nice to somebody. And that itself will make you feel better. At least that's true for me. And I, you know, I would wish the same for you. Well, um, you know, I was, as, as your second greatest achievement would say, we are such stuff as dreams are made on. Um, I am going to 
dramatically lower the tone of this conversation by handing it over to Samina, who is now going to ask you a bunch of silly questions about favorite dessert and other things. Samina, all yours. <laughs> well, Gautam, you, you've made me feel better because I continuously dream of joining NASA and going to space. So I'm going to hold on to that dream. Absolutely. No matter what. Okay. Um, Just so you know, you know, on the plausibility front, even now when I dream, I play innings, cricket innings, <laughs> except that now my dreams are more about if I played for my club, what would happen? <laughs> but I still dream. I, I actually go through ball by ball. Okay. So it, it is one of those things that I no longer can dream to be a, you know, a, a, a test cricketer at the world level, which is what I did when I was 18. But, uh, you know, uh, it is still, it is still useful. So yes, NASA is a good one. So I actually have one serious question and then I have some fun questions, but you mentioned your childhood and I, I always wonder this about everyone is, was there someone that was pivotal in, during your childhood in directing you or inspiring you? I think that the very clearly, I mean, uh, the, that is the easiest question in the world for me to answer. It was my mother. Uh, so uh, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> It doesn't take, I mean, she was an incredible role model. But I think in addition to my mother, whose contributions to my life is sort of, you know, there's a zero and a one. There, without her, there isn't, you know, not just in biological terms, but in, in human terms, there is no me. But uh, so that is completely un, un, unbeatable. Uh, my maternal grandmother was another one that was, uh, you know, my mother gave me strength and uh, principle. My grandmother taught me the value of kindness. And uh, <coughs> the, I guess the, the third part that I would uh, push for is uh, the, the school that I went to, which was uh, St. Columbus, which was uh, run by the uh, set of Roman Catholic priests who were incredible in their ability to not look at people in terms of what side of the rail tracks they came from. And uh, they had so many lessons of value that even today, I have never lived up to them, but they do good me to do better things over time. So I think those would be the three, yeah. Well, I think we, many of us are adding you to our list of people who are inspiring us no, to no. remember to be kind as well. So, um, I did have two fun questions. Because sure, absolutely. And I'm sorry about this. It's just that, you know, like with everything else, I, my mother is in India, I'm here, and you can imagine how this would be, so. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, so we've asked everyone, what is your favorite dessert? Ah, everything. <laughs> I did not get to be this size by refusing dessert. But if I had to pick one, uh, it's, I can't actually pick a single one, but I'm very, very fond of Indian desserts. Mm. And the sweeter they are and the more unhealthier they are, the more I love them. So I really love uh, all kinds of uh, Ras Malai and uh, Malai chops and things like that, and even Barfi and so on. So another, uh, you know, well, probably it's saving my life, but that I'm not getting them, but another effect of the, of the, uh, of the, of the laka, you know, of, of this quarantine. There are some good side effects of quarantine. That's yes, right. yes. For those of you who don't know, these are all desserts that are all saturated in butter and then like soaked in sugar water. So, you know, you can't go wrong with sugar and butter. So. <laughs> butter, exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. You probably traveled the world, Gautam. What is your favorite city? What is my favorite? City. Town, city in the world. City. Oh, I guess uh, I never thought I would say this, but... Uh, uh, I always thought Ann Arbor, Michigan was going to be my answer till the day I die. Yeah. But uh, New York City has made its, its uh, you know, it has made its, uh, its impact on me. I remember the first day I taught a class in the city, one of my students came up to me and asked me how long I'd been in New York. And I said, now, she said, how do you like it? And I said, I just came in yesterday. And she, her words turned out to be prophetic. She said, uh, Professor, uh, this is a city that forces you to love it. And uh, I have learned that uh, it, is, it is not for all the normal reasons. I have not, I don't see shows. I don't eat out very often. Uh, I basically, the only city thing that I use is, is, you know, I walk around, which I love doing and that's wonderful. But 
what I have found is that there is a zest for life that is really incredible. And as you would imagine, my original reaction to idea was that, you know, this is going to be a very harsh, impersonal place. And people are blunt, and that's true, but they're not unkind. They're very helpful. And if you think about it, fitting 8.3 million people into the area that it is fitting into, there's no room left for sharp elbows. You have to get along. And in that sense, uh, I love the spirit of the city because it helps you appreciate humanity in its, uh, you know, most distinct. So it's just amazing, uh, you know, one of the most wonderful incidents. And I'm sharing it because uh, the, uh, you know, it, it gives you a sense of how it works. One day I was coming out of the, of the subway and I had two bags of groceries with me and there was this girl walking ahead of me and she walked right through the turnstiles. And then she turned around. She didn't say a word to me. She just stretched out and she took the bags of groceries from me so I could walk through. And then she handed them back to me and she didn't even wait for the thank you. She just kept going, right? So this whole interaction at zero human, you know, this thing. And I have to tell you that the first time when she, because the way people think about New York, when she put her hands out to take the thing and I was handing it over to her, a thought crossed my mind that she might actually run off with it. <laughs> but that's happened so many times now that people will help me uh, in one way or another. And, uh, you know, you learn to, to do the same thing. So, uh, so there is this uh, general recognition that in this incredible experiment of life, we are all together. And that's what I love about it. Wow. Ann Arbor to New York. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a testament to, to the city. Um, and I, I actually love one thing you just said, which is blunt does not equal unkind, okay. right? Um, so that's, that's great. Um, that's something good to remember also when sometimes you get those reviewer feedbacks, right? Yes. <laughs> Well, I just on behalf of the division, Gautam, I want to thank you for making the time. I think we all learned so much from you. I learn every time I hear you speak. Um, so thank you so much. My and pleasure and thank you and, and stay safe and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, make sure that you're all wearing your masks. And if you have interest, I actually did a lot of research on masks because in New York, you can't go anywhere without one, without putting your life at risk. And I'll be happy to share it with whatever because good masks are incredibly difficult to get. So I will, I will give you my little this thing so you can, I can, you know, whatever it is that uh, I'll be happy to, to send it to you. Okay. Take care. And, Sounds and, great. Thanks uh, so much, Gautam. Thank you. And thanks everyone for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.